coming down the aisle know that you need one, and uh, they'd be glad to put a Bible in your hand so you can follow along this morning. We are studying the book of Ecclesiastes. This is our second week of a series through this book, and I just want to encourage you to read Ecclesiastes, and uh, especially get to the end as we're plowing our way through. It's more than any other book, this is a book we need to know the beginning from the end. I love a good magic trick. I love seeing the stage illusionists practice what they do. They are masters of distraction and deception. The world in which we live is a grand illusionist. The world in which we live practices deception and the art of distraction. The world in which we live makes promises, promises for meaning in life and fulfillment and satisfaction, promises for enduring happiness, for contentment. The illusionist on stage has nothing left when his tricks are exposed. You know, the old trick of sawing a woman in half. It seems so real, and there are so many different ways to go about making this trick happen, but it appears that a blade is going right through the midsection of some hapless victim. Until you see sort of behind the scenes, and you realize that the box that she's in has a false shelf, and she can sort of curl up her legs on the upper level while the false feet underneath are motorized and give some idea of movement. There are a number of ways to perform that trick, but once you know the trick, the illusion has lost its magic. I remember when I discovered that those cable cars in San Francisco weren't magic. I don't know if you've ever ridden those. There's no motor, no engine. The guy up front just has a lever and there's a bunch of seats and they go down the tracks up and down San Francisco. How do they do that? Then you discover that underground in the city center is a giant 500 horsepower engine, an electric motor that pulls these cables and the cars clamp onto them, catch on and ride the cables back and forth. The illusion is shattered. But once you realize that there is a trick, then you know that all such magic is just some combination of technology or sleight of hand or distractions or fast talking. The illusionist that is this life, this world, is skilled at the efforts of sleight of hand. The illusion of life is this, that all your efforts amount to something. All of your efforts amount to something. Think about it. You wake up every morning. You set out in life to get an education so that you can get a job which will lead to a career and and then you can pay your bills. Then maybe you can buy some things and maybe save up for the future and then retire and then waste away into oblivion and death. To what end? (laughs) What point to all of this effort? Or maybe you're, you're out to find that special someone that perfect someone, and, and have a family, and, and maybe you can pass on to them all the things that you've achieved. Maybe you'd like to make for yourself some lasting legacy. You know, get your name in the history books. Live forever in the memories of mere mortals. The illusion of this life is that your efforts amount to something. And the truth of this life is, they don't. That's the point of the message this morning. That's the point of the text in the Bible we're going to be looking at this morning. I would invite you to turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. If you thought, well, the text you're describing, is that really in my Bible? Yes, it is really in our Bibles. We're going to read it together. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities says the preacher. All is vanity. What advantage does man have in all his work which he does under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. 
Also, the sun rises and the sun sets, and hastening to its place, it rises there again. Blowing toward the south and turning toward the north, the wind continues swirling along, and on its circular courses, the wind returns. All the rivers flow into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place where the rivers flow, there they flow again. All things are wearisome. Man is not able to tell it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor is the ear filled with hearing. That which has been is that which will be, and that which has been done is that which will be done. So there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one might say, see this, it's new? Already it has existed for ages which were before us. There's no remembrance of earlier things, and also of the later things which will occur, there will be for them no remembrance among those who will come later still. Let's pray. Oh God, we come to your word. We come to your word to hear from you. And we need to think the way that you think. For we are so easily distracted and deceived by the sleight of hand of the ideas that swirl about in our world. And I pray as we look at this text of your word that we would be driven to the ends that you designed by it. God, I pray that you would grant a hearing of your word by the power of your Holy Spirit this morning. Surely there are those in this room still enslaved, still entrapped by the thoughts that what they do matter. And there are those of us who are distracted enough to believe that from time to time. We ask, oh God, that you would help us to get an under the sun perspective so that it will lead us to where you intend. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The illusion of this life is that your efforts in life amount to something. And the truth of this text is that they do not. And what we're going to look at this morning is Solomon's thesis <laughs> that nothing matters. And first, he gives a claim in verses 1 and 2. Uh, we read, these are the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, that is Solomon. And he declares himself the, the preacher, the teacher, the one who gathers an assembly for a hearing of truth. And here's his declaration in verse 2, the claim, vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Solomon's claim about life is that it is all futility. We're going to learn a, a new Hebrew word this morning. I know it's what you were looking forward to. Uh, the word for vanity here is the word hevel. It occurs 38 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. It is an important word for us to understand the meaning of this book. It is translated vanity or futility or emptiness, something that is fleeting, a vapor, or something that is worthless. Throughout Scripture, this word is used to describe a number of things, and sometimes the emphasis is on the transitory nature of something. It's there for a minute, then it's gone. And that could be positive or negative. And sometimes it's only a negative connotation dealing with the worthlessness of something. It's used to describe in this life vanity, folly, emptiness, a mere breath, something transitory. Or in Jeremiah 10:8, idols. Idols. Don't you know that your vanity is a block of wood? <laughs> Jeremiah says. In Ecclesiastes, this word hevel describes human labor, human wisdom, human folly, pleasure, the leaving the fruit of your work to someone else, mortality, success and competition, wealth, popularity, a legacy, having everything that you want, a big family and long life. The mere longing for something better is called a futility. Everybody's ideas are called hevel. Comedy, silliness, and laughter. The inequity of cause and effect. Things don't work out the way we think they should. Injustice. Everything that is to come in Ecclesiastes 8.11 is said to be hevel. Life itself is hevel. and The prime of life and youth, vanity. 
And here Solomon says, vanity of vanities. This is a way to give a, a superlative, a super superlative. If you were to say that football game was the Super Bowl of Super Bowls, I think we understand what you mean. A, a slave of slaves is an abject slave. Uh, the Bible uses this kind of superlative, king of kings, lord of lords. In Solomon's mind, what he is describing here is the vanity of all vanities, the vanity to beat all vanities. If you and I were to make a list of everything that is worthless, everything that is futile or vain or empty, what is it that it's at the top of Solomon's list? Everything. All is vanity. And this is a, a really remarkable picture he paints. And I think we have a slide here for the phrase. I think it's the next slide. There you go. You, you see two Hebrew words there. and uh, They look almost identical. The, the first word up there is our word hevel, and the second word is hokal. Uh, the first word is vanity or emptiness or worthlessness. And the next word is everything. Everything. And they look almost identical, and, and the only difference between those two Hebrew words is one minuscule little tail on the second letter in the first word. Almost identical words, visually speaking. It's like a visual rhyme that Solomon is playing off of here. The difference between those two words visually is very small, but the difference between meaninglessness and everything is an infinite chasm. And that's where Solomon is going to drive us. And, and this little phrase, all is vanity, serves as a bookend at the front end of Ecclesiastes, and we'll find it again in chapter 12, verse 8, at the end of Ecclesiastes. This is the intro and the exit for his sermon. Now, this is quite a claim. Vanity of vanities, everything is vanity. What, what side of the bed did Solomon get up on this morning? In verse 3, this leads us to a question. And the question, and really it's sort of backwards. The question in verse 3 is answered by the answer in verse 2. This is like the game show Jeopardy. Solomon gives the answer first and then asks the question. And you can imagine the game show contestant on this one. Alex, I'll take meaning of life for 200, please. Futility, emptiness, vanity of vanities. What are all the things that I've ever done? <laughs> Correct. Select again. Okay, thanks, Alex. I'll take 19th century German philosophers for a 1,000. Solomon gives the answer and then the question. And notice this question. Solomon says, what advantage or what profit does man have in all of his work which he does under the sun? And the word here for advantage is, is really what remains that which is left over after all of the effort, what, what did you get out of it that remains? Profit is a good translation of this word. And the word here for work, he, he doesn't just mean your nine to five job. He means all of your efforts, all of your labor. In many contexts, this word labor has a negative connotation. It's meaning something like wearisome labor or toil or hardship. It's certainly true in this context. An all-encompassing reality that all the efforts of mankind are profitless. He literally says, the labor with which he labors. And you just feel the laborious nature with which Solomon even makes this claim. There's something you can't see in the English text in this little word, man. What advantage does man have? We might think he means mankind. Literally, the Hebrew has the definite article. He says, the man, and the Hebrew word for man is Adam. He says, ha-Adam, the man. In other words, a reference to the fall, to Adam, to the curse on work and life. What advantage is there to the man? And I think Solomon here has in view an allusion to the curse placed on man's labors as Adam and Eve were being expelled from the garden. Listen to Genesis 3. Then to Adam, God said, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil, same word as labor here, in toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it will grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, 
and to dust you shall return. It's a pretty pessimistic picture (laughs) or a realistic picture of life after the fall, life in a broken world, life in a world cursed by God where every effort of man is frustrated, hindered, held up. Consider the things that you do. Mow the lawn. Maybe you have rocks in your yard and you have to pull up the weeds. But it's not like you could pull up the weeds or, or mow the grass and it'd be done. Ah, satisfaction. <laughs> no, you bought a lawnmower so you could do it over and over and over again. You've got to pull the weeds again. Think about housework. A, a friend of mine recently defined housework this way, moving dirt from one location in your home to another. Couldn't we just mow the lawn, mop the floor, put in a light bulb, write the computer code, paint the fence, change the diaper, feed the dog, wash the car, pave the roads, straighten the hair? For my, that was a reference for my wife and four daughters. Uh, they're convinced that Ecclesiastes 115 can be beaten, right? It says, what is crooked cannot be straightened. <laughs> Can't we just do all those things and be done with it? To actually accomplish something that endures, something that lasts longer than the breath that you exhale on a cold morning? This question, what profit, is a most vital question for us. It's the doorway to the theme of this book. And maybe there's no more important question. Maybe there's no more important book than Ecclesiastes for daily practical living. In fact, I know a biblical counselor friend who said that Ecclesiastes, if understood and applied, would solve 75% of all counseling problems. You and I seldom stop long enough to ask the question, why am I here? What is this all for? To what end are all my labors? Am I accomplishing anything? And Solomon says in verse 3, What advantage does the man have in all his work which he does under the sun? And that little phrase, under the sun, is an important qualifier. In fact, it's going to lead us to the answer to the dilemma, and we'll get there in a few moments. Next, we see in verse 4 the demonstration of Solomon's claim. He's going to demonstrate the truths of this astounding claim that all is vanity. And he's going to demonstrate it in a number of ways. In verse 4, he's going to demonstrate it through the generations of humanity. In verses 5 to 7, through the cycles of nature. And then in verses 8 to 11, the history of novelty. He leads us first into the generations of humanity. Look at verse 4. A generation goes and a generation comes but the earth remains forever. Think about the way that Solomon even sets this up. We we normally think of a generation coming and then going, coming at the beginning and then going at the end, and and he reverses the order. It's like the primacy in his mind is death, that a generation is going out of existence, and another one comes, follows it up, and it's headed to the same place. Think of all the generations that have come before yours, and the generations that may come after. And one comes after another in a, in a monotonous litany of generation after generation. At the end of them all is death. And when people are young, they think that old people are all washed up and they don't know anything and they've never experienced anything. And that everything that a junior hire experiences is the first time it's ever been done, the first time it's ever been experienced, the first time this knowledge has ever been gained. It's all been done before. You're laughing if you know. The junior hires aren't laughing. (laughs) The people who are old now, they thought the same things of the generations before them. And in a few brief moments, those junior hires will be old. And the generation after them will be convinced that they don't know anything either. (laughs) And the futility of all of this is universal. I read a little bit this week about cryogenics, right? That's the science of freezing things. They're freezing all kinds of things. I like to freeze grapes. That's good. They're freezing rabbit brains in the hopes that they could chemically preserve the brain of a bunny 
at 211 degrees below Fahrenheit. Why? To make a solid, glassy orb that can be melted with all of its synapses intact, with its personality in place and and its memories available. Why are they doing this? They're they're trying to beat what Solomon says here, a generation goes. (laughs) The very fact that people are trying to cryogenically preserve themselves is evidence of this monotonous curse. It's an attempt to escape the vicious cycle of one generation after another. And they go and they come. They're trying to solve the futility of the going. (laughs) They're trying to maybe get beyond that generation going and, and insert some sort of meaning beyond the grave, some sort of meaning beyond the allotted time here on earth. And that endeavor is a futility. Solomon goes on to demonstrate his audacious claim that all is futility through nature. In verses 5 to 7, he gives three examples of the cyclical nature of our world. He begins with the sun in verse 5. He says, also the sun rises and the sun sets, and hastening to its place, it rises there again. The sun comes up, and it seems to be busy about doing something very important. The sun has places to go and things to do. Literally here, the the sun is said to pant, uh, that verb for hastening to its place. Uh, The sun is panting in a a wearied exhaustion of, of racing across the sky, getting to the finish line. But wait, the next morning, he's up and at it again wearying himself to cross the same old sky to the same old finish line just to do it again the next day. And the sun here is a visual metaphor for the tiresome monotony and purposelessness of our earthly existence. Pink Floyd philosopher Roger Waters put it this way. And you run and you run to catch up with the sun, but it's sinking, racing around to come up behind you again. The sun is the same in a relative way, but you're older, shorter of breath, and one day closer to death. Every year is getting shorter, never seem to find the time. Plans that either come to naught or half a page of scribbled lines, hanging on in quiet desperation is the English way. The time is gone, the song is over, thought I'd something more to say. Solomon next moves to the wind. Verse 6, blowing toward the south and turning toward the north, the wind continues swirling along, and on its circular courses, the wind returns. This verse in Hebrew is filled with participles. There's no real verb. The, the, The sentence grammatically just doesn't seem to go anywhere. It's just all these I-N-G words. To put it somewhat literally, we might read it this way, continually going to the south and turning again to the north, turning and turning, the wind going on its circuitous paths returning. (laughs) Like that wasn't a complete sentence. No, it wasn't. (laughs) It's just this incomplete, continuous, incessant swirling and turning and returning and turning of the wind. Even the Hebrew words and sounds carry the incessant monotony of the swirling, twirling wind turning and returning on its circular paths. You and I understand the the jet stream and the Coriolis effect. Every day the sun beats down on the earth's surface and causes the hot air to rise, and because of the friction and the turning of the earth, it spins it in opposite circles in the northern and the southern hemisphere and creates all of our wind patterns and weather systems, and it just keeps going and going and going. And where does the wind come from, and where does it stop? And and you can't quite catch it. And all of this effort, all of this motion, doesn't it finally get somewhere? And then Solomon turns to the rivers in verse 7. All the rivers flow into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place where the rivers flow, there they flow again. Here's another Hebrew verse filled with participles. It's just this incessant grammar. He's trying to make us tired even in his illustrations. I've probably made you tired of them already. All the rivers running to the sea, returning to return to the place from where they are coming. 
this incessant flow of water into the vast ocean basins. And yet, what progress? To what end? What effect? The rivers spend all of their moments trying to fill up the oceans, but the oceans are never filled. What futility, says Solomon. The Nile River averages over 79 billion gallons of water discharged daily into the Mediterranean Sea. But the Mediterranean beaches are in the same place they were yesterday. The water doesn't seem to be getting any fuller. Perhaps Solomon had in view the Dead Sea and the Jordan River that flows into it. That one's remarkable because as the lowest sea on earth, it has no outlet. Water flows in every single day, and yet the sea is not rising. What a futility. You and I would understand the hydrological cycle, right? The evaporated moisture coming off of the oceans forms clouds and the winds drive it over the land and those clouds dispense water and snow that fill up the rivers and send the water back to the ocean. It's a fantastic system. Solomon is not trying here to give us a cosmology to study. He's using the rivers as a metaphor to describe the futility of all of life. The cycle continues in an endless repetition It's a metaphor for the wearying rounds of life, all the effort, all the labor, all the panting, racing, swirling, flowing, and nothing to show for it. Life is like a giant merry-go-round. It seems like a lot of fun when you're four, the merry-go-round. A lot of movement, though, with no progress. You go, and you go, and you go, and when you're done, you're still at the same place you started, except that your shirt and the playground are covered in your vomit. That's the picture Solomon is painting. A weary go-round. We're to be tired of the relentless monotony, monotony of this life, just going and going and going with no apparent end. In 1967, singer songwriter Joni Mitchell, peering out of the window of an airplane, penned the words to the song, Both Sides Now where she described the phenomenon of looking at clouds from two different perspectives. She writes, Rows and flows of angel hair and ice cream castles in the air, feather canyons everywhere. I've looked at clouds that way. But now, they only block the sun. They rain, they snow on everyone. So many things I would have done, but clouds got in my way. I've looked at clouds from both sides now from up and down, and still somehow it's clouds illusions, I recall. I really don't know clouds at all. She moves from meteorological phenomenon to love. She describes love this way, moons and junes and Ferris wheels, the dizzy dancing way that you feel. As every fairy tale comes real, I've I've looked at love that way. But now, it's just another show. You leave them laughing when you go, and if you care, don't let them know. Don't give yourself away. I've looked at love from both sides now, from give and take, and still somehow it's love's illusions, I recall. I really don't know love at all. And then she moves to life itself. She writes, tears and fears and feeling proud to say I love you right out loud. Dreams and schemes and circus crowds, I've looked at life that way. Oh, but now old friends are acting strange. They shake their heads. They say, I've changed. Well, something's lost, but something's gained in living every day. I've looked at life from both sides now, from win and lose, and still somehow it's life's illusions, I recall. I really don't know life at all. The fact that this song has been covered by no less than 97 artists from Judy Collins to Bing Crosby to Neil Diamond, Willie Nelson, even Leonard Nimoy. I think that's weird. You know, did I get it right? Courtney Love. The fact that so many people have covered this song indicates that the philosophy voiced in these lyrics strikes a nerve in the hearts of us mortals. Whether the young fool with his glass half full or the singer-songwriter philosopher with her glass half empty In the end, they are both leveled by the great equalizer, 
death. Solomon makes that evident in chapter 12. Every half full glass, every half empty glass will be shattered. And whatever water was inside will spill out on the ground only to evaporate back into the atmosphere to be placed in another glass by another generation. It's a fitting metaphor for the fleeting vapor that is life under the sun. The naive in our world are tricked by the illusion of life. The seasoned know that this meaning, that meaning in this life is illusory. It cannot be achieved. No matter your efforts, no matter the efforts of all the generations that have gone before, nor the efforts of all the generations who will come afterwards. By the way, I'm going to apologize right now um, for what I suspect will take place throughout this series in Ecclesiastes. Relentless quotations from 20th century music. (laughs) See, something happens when you sit around for hours with a guitar and nothing else to do. You ponder. You ponder life. Artists and musicians and thinkers, they're not out there bringing home bacon. They're doing important things. Reflecting, considering, musing. And they often get more quickly to the questions that you and I ought to be asking. What is life really about? Is there meaning to be found? (laughs) Solomon turns one more place to describe his claim, to give an illustration of his claim that all is vanity. In verse 8, he says, All things are wearisome. Man isn't able to tell it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor is the ear filled with hearing. And verse 8 transitions us in Solomon's pen to the history of novelty. He says that all things are wearisome. Human words can't even describe how wearisome everything is, but we keep trying and trying and trying to find the answers under the sun. He says the eye is not satisfied with seeing and the ear is not filled with hearing. I mean, couldn't there be one image to end all photography? Couldn't there be one song to end all music? Couldn't there be one composition or one idea to make every book obsolete? The eye is never filled. The ears are never satisfied. We keep looking, we keep listening, we keep hoping for something new just around the next corner, something to come along to give the answers, to bring conclusion, to reveal fulfillment and contentment. And if we don't have it, maybe the next generation will. Could there be some answer to the question we just haven't found yet, some solution to the problem of life, if we just kept looking? Is there something new? And Solomon says, that which has been is that which will be. And that which has been done is that which will be done. Verse 9, so there is nothing new under the sun. It's nothing new under the sun. It's it's all been done before. And you might be thinking what I was thinking. Wait, now wait a second, Solomon. Surely there are new things. Solomon answers the question in verse 10. Is there anything of which one might say, see this, it is new. Already it has existed for ages which were before us. He anticipates our question and he shuts the door on it. I mean, what about space travel? The eye watch, medical breakthroughs. In the year 2015, the U.S. Patent Office awarded 298,407 patents for new inventions. Since the establishment of the U.S. Patent Office in 1836, there have been over 8 million patents awarded for new inventions. The new technologies are improvements on technologies that went before them. One famous inventor said, I I never made anything new. I just improved on what I already had. Space travel is transportation. Texting is communication. You can decide for yourself whether or not that's an improvement. The Internet is connectivity. The heart transplant is the extension of life expectancy. By the way, life expectancy in the last 70 years has gone up 10 years. Isn't that great news? Wait, 70 to 10. It's not a lot of progress. And while we certainly would admit that technological advances 
are new in a relative sense. There are improvements to be had. They, they improve our experiences. They, they may make things more convenient. None of these things is new in the sense that Solomon is driving at. Some answer to life. Something that will bring lasting fulfillment. Something that will bring satisfaction. Something that will bring enduring contentment or lasting happiness. In fact, eight million patents demonstrate humanity's insatiable desire for progress. That we have not yet arrived. <laughs> and we never will. Man's search for something new is a demonstration that there is nothing new under the sun. The fool, the naive, the optimist is still convinced that this broken world will keep its promises. That the magic is real. That ultimate satisfaction is just around the corner. Just give it one more generation. Just give me one more experience. One more pleasure. One more enterprise. One more relationship. One more dollar. One more project. One more gadget. But the veteran of life's disappointments, the pessimist, the realist, has come to the realization that a broken world can't keep its promises. The charade is over. The illusion has been diffused. The hope of ultimate meaning in something under the sun has evaporated like the morning mist. That is what Solomon is driving at. Look at verse 11. There's no remembrance of earlier things. And also of the later things which will occur, there will be for them no remembrance among those who will come later still. One writer put it this way, today's celebrities are tomorrow's obituaries. Things seem new to us now because we don't remember anything past the last 15 minutes of world history. It's all been done. It's all been tried. The people that come after us will think they're onto something new and they'll forget what we did. Do you remember all those things that you've already forgotten? It's a trick question. Of course you don't. <laughs> this brings us this morning to the end of this text. It's not the end of the sermon. Remember, Ecclesiastes, more than any other book in your Bible, is a book that is rightly understood from the end with the conclusion in view. That little qualifier in verse 3 that all a man's efforts are a futility under the sun. A little qualifier is so essential for us. We need something other than an under the sun perspective. We need to get off the gaze of a horizontal look at life and meaning and purpose and satisfaction. We need a vertical view. That is exactly what Solomon is intending to drive us toward. To cause us to despair of a merely horizontal view of life and meaning and happiness. So he says in Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 and 14, the conclusion, when all has been heard, is fear God and keep his commandments, because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. What is the answer to life? It is a, a view over the sun. Meaning isn't to be found under the sun. In fact, it's hardwired into earthly existence not to give the meaning we're searching for. Our earthly existence is under the curse by God because God doesn't want us to find our final things, our ultimate things, our real realities in a broken world. The fact that Solomon says in verse 14 that God is going to bring every act to judgment means that things now aren't the way they're supposed to be. God has already assessed that this world is broken. If, if you're just here this morning figuring it out for the first time, again, there's nothing new under the sun. God knows that everything is broken, that things aren't the way they should. We've been kicked out of the garden. Our labors are futile because they're cursed. But there's a judgment coming. We sang about it this morning. Christ is coming back and will set all things right. 
The fact that a judgment is coming means that God is going to make it right. Things aren't how they are supposed to be. But a change is coming. When God himself was here on the earth, Jesus, he said something greater than Solomon is in your midst. So Ecclesiastes 12 is not the end of the sermon either. It terminates in Christ. It terminates in Jesus. Christ has come. And Jesus came from beyond our horizon to give us better than a horizontal view on life, to lift our gaze vertically. But better than that, better than to change our perspective, Jesus actually purchased for us freedom from the tyranny of the curse. Freedom from the tyranny of a frustrated world. He actually purchased for us redemption from the futility of our existence. And this is the good news Josh was talking about earlier. That God himself and the person of Jesus, the Messiah, came to our cursed world. And as Paul says in Galatians, actually became a curse for us, hanging on a tree, exposed between God and man as an intermediary, as a substitute to take all of our crimes against God, all of our misdeeds, all of our sins, all of our failings, take them upon himself and bear them before his Father and be judged by his Father for them in our place so that everyone who believes has every sin, past, present, and future, wiped away to the end that he would have direct access to his Maker. And the conclusion Solomon lays out for us in Ecclesiastes 12 is a right relationship to your maker makes sense out of all of life. So that even through the crazy mixed up world that we live in, a broken and frustrated world, there are shafts of God's goodness and kindness and joy like beams of light that penetrate through the darkness that give us a joy we can experience now. And Ecclesiastes is not shy about those. From eating and drinking to the joys of married life to work. All the things that God gives as gifts, he gives the enjoyment of them if you're rightly related to him. And Jesus came to purchase us, for us, those very things. An eternal life outside of a frustrated world forever and ever and ever in his presence. And in the meantime, in a broken world, Preminders of that eternal reality. That is what Jesus has done for us so that life under the sun is radically transformed by our life in the sun, S O N. And you know, Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun but God. He says there are things that are new. God's over the sun, beyond our horizon perspective, says things like Isaiah 43, 19, that he will do something new. And while all of humanity is on the hamster wheel, running and running and trying and trying and never getting anywhere, God's going somewhere. He promises a new covenant to his people in Jeremiah 31. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he promises that all who are in Christ Jesus are what? A new creation. And then he makes this promise throughout the scriptures of a new heavens and a new earth. According to Revelation 21, 3, where the curse itself is done away with. God does something new. Believers get to participate <laughs> in God's good gifts. I want you to think about Solomon's perspective on the creation. Remember how he said the, the sun is just wasted of his breath. He's out of breath, racing from one end of the sky to the other. Right? That's the pessimist's view of creation that Solomon is driving all of us to in this book. And yet there's another way to look at the sun. Psalm 19 Here's a, here's a godly perspective on the same phenomenon. 
He's talking about the heavens declaring the glory of God. The created order being a witness to who God is and his kindness, his beauty, his strength, his attributes. He says the, the words of creation, they're, they're sort of a wordless voice, has gone out into all the earth, their utterances to the end of the world. In them he has placed a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, rejoicing as a strong man to run its course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. That is a positive perspective on the sun. You see, there's a a godly perspective to even life in a frustrated world that comes through Christ. You could give examples in Scripture of the hydrological cycle and and the acts of the wind as well. Everything Solomon uses as a metaphor for the dreariness, monotony of the hamster wheel of life. A right relationship to your Creator makes all those things new. A source of joy. And it's a joy ultimately found in him alone. Will you pray? God, we thank you so much for this, your word. To diffuse the illusion of life, the empty, vain, worthless promise that life under the sun holds out for us satisfaction, joy, contentment, happiness, No doubt, oh God, there are some in this room still convinced that life will make good on its promise, that a broken world will do what it can't do. God, I pray that you would rescue such from the vanity of that perspective unto real life and joy through the gospel of your son who laid down his life to purchase for us that freedom. And there are the rest of us in this room who know you, who have been rightly related to you by the death of your son through faith and repentance, who are still distracted by this world, who still fall for its illusions, its cheap tricks. And I pray that you would liberate us again every day unto a right perspective of where life truly is where meaning truly is, where lasting joy and contentment and happiness are found. And it is only in you through your son, Jesus Christ. It is to him that we sing, and it is in his name that we pray.